welcome to our fall online Bible study. Let's start at the beginning. I'm delighted that you are here with us. And let me, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Pastor Kayla Burge. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Elk City Hub. And I'm just so excited that you're going to take this journey with us. Now, during this study, we'll be looking at the book of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis over the next couple of weeks, not only to see what the book of Genesis says in an in-depth kind of way, but also to see how reading the book of Genesis carefully, at least said at the very beginning, can perhaps lay out for us a way that we Christians approach scripture in general, not only to feed our minds, but to also feed our hearts and that way we can learn with the brain that God has given to us and allow his word to really change our hearts, which is ultimately what Jesus calls us to do, to change our hearts and our lives. And hopefully as we unpack those first chapters in the book of Genesis, we will be able to make some of those connections about our daily living as well. Now, I want to encourage you to grab your Bible while taking this study. If you don't have one, contact our church or check out the many online options from BibleGateway.com. Now, I want to remind you, it is always important when we read the scriptures to pray and ask the Lord to guide that activity and that reading and that study. So I want us to begin today with a word of prayer, if you'll pray with me. O Lord God, in the beginning you spoke the world into creation. And in Jesus, your word was made flesh, and we were recreated, and we were given the opportunity for resurrection. Thank you for gathering us here together in this place to be focused on your word. Please guide us by your Holy Spirit so that in all that we say and hear, that we may be drawn deeper into the experience of your love. Grant our world all the blessings that it needs bring peace to troubled parts of our world, bring strength to those who are weak and healing to those who are sick, bring comfort to those who mourn and bring us wisdom through your word. We pray all of this in Christ's name, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, it all starts with God. It starts with a God who wishes to be known, a God who wishes to communicate. It all starts with a God who creates a creature with whom he can speak. It all starts with a God whose love finds its completion in flowing out of itself toward the creatures that he has made. Think of the movie, The Ten Commandments. The scene where Moses, played by Charles Heston, is up on the mountain and the bush is burning and God speaks to him. And finally, Moses says, by the way, what is your name? God. And what does God say? I am. I am or I am who I am. That's the official translation. But Walter Casper, a cardinal of Germany, wrote in one of his books about that experience that Moses had on Mount Sinai, where he asked God his name. And Casper does a very careful study of the Hebrew of that name. And he says that the English translation, I am, is really too flat. I am, it doesn't get to the heart of the Hebrew. He says the heart of the Hebrew in God's name is that God implies that I am here for you. That the very name of God means I am the one who's going to be here for you. I am the one who's here for you. I exist, so you exist. I'm going to be here for you. That is God's own name. And in the Old Testament, especially if you knew somebody's name, you knew who they were at their inner core. That's why if somebody's inner core changed through a conversion like Saul becoming Paul or Abram becoming Abraham. So if you knew somebody's name 
you knew them at their core. And if their core changed, then guess what? Their name changed. Well, what does God's name say? I am here for you. So this is a God who wants to be in relationship. And you know, in relationships, the only way they work is if you make yourself known, right? I mean, how do you think a relationship in which you never share a single fact about yourself is going to go? Not really great, right? I mean, that's not a real relationship. Relationships require revelation, sharing, intimacy, communication. And we have a God, and it all starts with a God whose very nature seems to be that he wants to communicate and be in relationship with us. And ultimately, he does that. He makes himself known by sending Jesus, the word who becomes flesh. Okay? So I want to go back to that word, though, revelation. Maybe you get nervous about the word revelation. I mean, oftentimes I get nervous around people who say they've had a revelation. I mean, I've had conversations go like this. I had a revelation. God told me what type of diet I should go on. And I'm thinking, really? All right. And you go, you know, I didn't know God was in the nutrition business, but congratulations. I mean, right? That's what we kind of say. And that sometimes that word revelation, I've had a revelation, but let me tell you that revelation in the Judeo-Christian sense means simply God making God's own self known. God making himself known. And God accomplishes that in a lot of ways. And one of the most profound, and in fact, the first, according to the Bible, is through God's word. Through God's word, God speaks. So God wants to be known. God creates a world and creatures that is really us, with whom God can have a relationship with. God wants to be known by his creatures, the creatures he has made. So how does God do that? By revealing himself, that is making himself known to the ones that he loves. The ones he wants to be there for. And he does it primarily through his word. And so what is the Bible? Well, the Bible is our record of how God has revealed himself to us. How God has made himself known to us. And the very word Bible, ta biblia in Greek, means the books. I mean, notice it's plural, not singular. It's plural, the books. And you know that, I mean, even if you haven't ever studied the scripture in any serious way, you know that there are books in the Bible. You got the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, the book of the prophet Isaiah, the first letter to the Corinthians, the book of Revelation you know that there are books in the Bible. So in the, the Bible, it's a collection of books, which are doing what? They are recording how God has made himself known to us. Because God loves us and wants to be known. It is the record of our experience of God's self-revelation. You see, we believe as Christians, we cannot know God without knowing his word. And if the first thing God does is speak, then guess what? We probably should be listening. I mean, when God chooses to speak, shouldn't we as his creatures listen? And the Bible is the written word. The written record of what we have heard God saying. We cannot know God. We cannot be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ without turning again and again to the scriptures for its teaching. It's prayer. It's wisdom for our conversion and for our life. 
No, I'm going to say this. You know that not everyone reads the Bible the same way, right? Not everybody reads the books the same way. So let's talk about really both ends of the spectrum, okay? One end of the spectrum is what I would probably call the Bible as very just nice literature, which basically people will sometimes grudgingly say, well, you know, the Bible is be a beautiful book, has a lot of great stories in it. It really contains some wonderful human wisdom that transcends throughout the ages. And, you know, we should probably be familiar with it because it's inspired so much of Christian art and music and culture. So an intelligent person should know the scriptures because it's a great collection of human wisdom. Maybe you've bumped into that end of the spectrum in terms of the Bible. But notice, in no way would they, on that side of the spectrum, say that it is the word of God or inspired by God. Because if you push them, I'm not sure really where they would fall in terms of whether God even exists or not. But it could inspire us because it's beautiful literature and like so many other examples of beautiful literature. So we need to be aware of it. That's one end of the spectrum. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, which says, God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. That's a catchphrase. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And that approach to scripture is what we might call a literalist approach to scripture. Or you'll hear it called maybe even fundamentalism. This means that this is the word of God as contained in the scripture and is written in exactly the same way that we as modern 21st century people write and read. That how we write, might write history is how they wrote history. Therefore, the way they wrote history in the Bible is the way we expect it written. Therefore, when the book of Genesis says that the world was created in seven days, they were writing history the way that we would write history. Therefore, seven days means seven days. And if you tell me that it took millions of years, then I'm going to sit there with a straight face and say, you're wrong. Because the word of God says it's seven days in that 24-7 period. So, the positive of this approach, though, is that is that they believe that this really is God speaking to us. Where I think the problem is, is that the way it's read is that God spoke to people 2,000 years before Christ, some of which is recorded here in exactly the same way that we expect God to speak to us today. We impose modern expectations about history, science, and biography and we project them back thousands of years so that if you question anything in here, then you're being unfaithful. So let's look at that. There's this dichotomy that's going on that's understood in that approach to the Bible, which is that there is a battle between science and faith, creationism and evolution, the great battle between the two. So on one spectrum, of understanding the Bible. It's this nice collection of human writing. The other extreme of the spectrum is that it is the word of God. And what I mean by that is that it's answering my modern questions, even though some of it was written thousands of years ago without ever taking into account how did people back then express and understand truth? How did they tell their most important tr truths? How did they write their quote unquote history? Is that the same way that we do? Or are we projecting back modern expectations about history? So if those are the ends of the spectrum, where can we find the broad tradition of the church? Well, one thing that has come to be really more prominent in our culture lately is we seem to think that everything is in black or white. 
but let me give you a new perspective a little bit. Most of us in the Methodist theological tradition understand that tradition is a both and. It's not an either or, it's a both and. I mean, is Jesus human or is he divine? He's both. He is both fully human and fully divine. Are human beings holy or sinful? Well, we're both. We're both holy because we were created in the image of God and we're a bunch of sinners. Is the Bible the word of God or is it a human words? Well, it's, it's both. And to properly understand it, we have to take both of those realities seriously because it is both and. And what I mean by that it is that scripture, as we understand it, the Bible, as we understand it, absolutely contains the truth that comes from God to save us. And it contains it in a way that nothing else does. It is inspired by God. And it is the work of human hands. Written down transcribed, translated, but it contains God's truth, but it all is also the work of the scribe's hands. Let me put it to you this way. In Article 4 of the Confession of Faith, which is in our Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church, it says this, we believe the Holy Bible, Old and New Testaments, reveal the words of God so far as it is necessary for our salvation. It is to be received through the Holy Spirit as the true rule and guide for faith and practice. Whatever is not revealed in or established by the Holy Scriptures is not made to be made an article of faith, nor is it to be taught as an essential to salvation. You see, we believe that scriptures contain the truth. What kind of truth? Well, primarily that truth which God wanted put there. Now, for what purpose is all this? Our salvation. Our salvation, it is the saving truth that comes to us in the scripture. The Bible is primarily a book about saving us. God, first of all, choosing us because he loves us and then choosing to save us by sending his only son. So, every truth that we need to know in order to experience the power of that salvation in our own lives is firmly and faithfully presented in the scriptures. Now, what I want you to do right now is to get your Bibles out for a moment. If you need to pause this video to go get it, go get, go get your Bible. But I want you to go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. But in Genesis 1, 1, it literally starts in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then go, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And if you have paragraphs, headings, what do you see at the top of Genesis chapter 12? You see something around the understanding of the story of Abraham. Maybe the Lord's promise to Abram. Abraham, the start of the Jewish people. He's the father of the Jewish people. I'm going to ask you. How many chapters of what we call prehistory does the Bible give us? Basically 11. Now put your finger in Genesis chapter 12 and just go to the end of the Old Testament. End of the Old Testament. Now, to find the end of the Old Testament, you know it's the end of the Old Testament when you bump into Matthew, which is the beginning of the New Testament. Now, are you with me? You got your finger in there? 
how much does the Bible tell us about ancient, ancient history from the beginning of the beginning to just a couple thousand years before Christ? About 11 chapters. And how much does the Bible give us in the story of God choosing his people and then sinning and God calling them back and then sinning again and God calling them back and then they sin again and God calls them back? We get that much. Are you with me? What do you think the major theme of scripture is? Is it telling everything of ancient history from the beginning of creation up to the Jewish people? Or is it the story of how God interacts with his chosen people? You see my point? I mean, really, let's look at that. The thickness, just the thickness of the pages tells you the Bible is not intended as a scientific prehistory to answer every question that we bring to it. How are the mountains made? How did cre the creation of animals actually take place? How many centuries did it take? We get 11 small chapters and then we go from chapter 12 to the gospel. And actually, if you want to do it that way, you have 11 chapters of prehistory and the rest of the book is about saving us. That's the point of God's revelation. Saving us, loving us changing us, leading us to eternity. All the things that people like to fight about, well, is it evolution or creationism? Is it seven days or seven millennia? Was it the Big Bang or was it Genesis 1-1? Just by the physical nature of the Bible, you can see the Bible wasn't attempting to answer all of the modern questions that we bring to it. Its focus, the length and breadth of the story, is about God in relationship to people. So the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which cause so many fights among people who read the scriptures differently, these chapters are doing the very same thing that the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke do. What do I mean by that? Well, you know the Christmas stories, right? The shepherds, the wise men, the angel Gabriel, the manger, all that. How many chapters of Christmas story are in totality in the New Testament? Take a wild guess. Got your answer? Got it locked in? Four. In fact, if I were writing a biography of Jesus today, what I would do, like any modern biography, I would start at the very beginning. And I'd get every story possible, right? Everything I could find out about their childhood and just go chapter by chapter, decade by decade, era of life by era of life. But in the New Testament, that's not what we get. We get four chapters. Jesus is born, they run off to Egypt, next thing you know, he's 11, and then he's 30. And you go, what, wait, what, where, what about the gaps? I mean, what kind of teenager was he like? Where'd he go to school? What was he like as a young man? Did Joseph have trouble with him learning, teaching him carpentry? The scripture scholars tell us that the introductory chapters of Matthew and Luke, if you read them properly, you realize that Matthew and Luke are doing, are telling the story of Jesus' birth to get us ready for his ministry, his adult life. 
they set up the themes that are going to be played out in his adult life. And the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are primarily about three years in his life, in Jesus' life, depending on how you count between 30 and 33. But they're not writing a biography the way that we want them to write a biography. You see, we want to know when they crucified him, how did it work, where did they put the, the nails, what was the medical reality? And if you read Mark's gospel, what's it say? And they crucified him and they, then he moves on and you want to just be like, wait, what? You want to just slap Mark across the face and be like, I want the details. But you see, he's not telling the story the way that we want it told. One of the reasons Mark didn't have to tell the details is because the Romans were still crucifying people when he wrote the gospel. And it was a horrible, horrible description. You didn't have to say what happened because people who lived in that part of the world saw it with an ugly regularity. I mean, am I making sense? But the point was he wasn't writing a medical account of the death of Jesus. Now, he was trying to tell us how his death saves us. But you see, we want to ask questions of scripture using our modern science mind. We want those answers. That's how we read. That's how we would tell the story. What we have to do is take the scriptures, though, on its own terms. And my point about talking about the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke was they set up for us what is the most important part of the story in the gospel. In the gospel writer's mind, they set up what is most important, which is his adult life. Well, the first chapters of Genesis, what are they doing? They're being written. They're being told to us to get us ready for what is clearly the main part of the story. Which is, how does God love his people? I mean, how does God save his people? That's what all this scripture is about. So just as the gospels don't tell us the details that we sometimes want in a way that we want, Genesis is not telling the science of our prehistory in the way that we want sometimes. And we sometimes ask those questions. But it is telling us firmly and faithfully the truth that saves us. So God is at work, inspiring the work. Inspire means, it's, it's a Latin term, and to, it means to breathe in, inspiration. To breathe in, to be working like breath in a person. But the person was using their own brain and energy to tell the truth as they understood it. If you want an example of this, go to Luke's Gospel, the very first chapter of Luke's Gospel, Luke 1.1. 1, 1. Luke 1.1. 1, 1. Many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world delivered them to us. It seemed good to me, also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. That's Luke 1, 1 through, uh, through verse 4. And I want you to think about that. I mean, I don't know what your translation exactly said, but notice what Luke says. Luke does not say 
God sat on my shoulder in the form of a bird and whispered into my ear. Chapter 1, verse 1. Write this down. Now, Luke, you pay attention. Stop looking at that squirrel. Pay attention. No. What does Luke tell us about what how he wrote his gospel well look what he says first of all he says i know that others have done this many have undertaken the task to compile a narrative of the events which have been fulfilled in our midst precisely as those events were transmitted to us by the original eyewitnesses what's that tell us that before the gospel got written down, it was orally transmitted. The preaching of the earliest preachers, the accounts of the eyewitnesses, which then raises the question, whoever wrote Luke, was he an eyewitness? Or was he telling us what the eyewitnesses told him? But the point is, first of all, he's aware of other written accounts. He told us that, and he's telling us that he listened to the oral accounts of the eyewitnesses. He's doing his homework. He's using the brain that God has given him. Now find out what the eyewitnesses said. Find out what the other written traditions about Jesus says, excuse me. <coughs> and then he says, I too, <clears throat> have carefully traced the whole sequence of events from the beginning. <clears throat> I've done my work so that you may see how reliable was the instruction. And so what's the last part in your translation? How well founded the teaching is that you have received. What's that tell us? Well, Luke is writing to people who have already heard the preaching of the gospel. He's writing a written account to confirm their faith. He's writing for a specific community, a specific community who's already heard the preaching. And what's he trying to do? Well, he's trying to confirm their faith. That means he's not having to tell them everything that he knows because they may know that already. But what I need to do is write an orderly account to confirm their faith. You see, Luke doesn't say everything that Matthew does. Mark doesn't say everything that John does. Why? Each of them were writing for different communities in different circumstances and at different times. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that this is inspired work. That God inspired the author of Luke and used his brain and did his homework. And Luke wrote this written account for a specific purpose, for a specific group of people. He was acting as a human author. And we believe 2,000 years later that God, though, was inspiring every single word of that work so that the truth that we need for salvation can be found in the scriptures. If we didn't have Luke, we wouldn't know the story of the Good Samaritan. And how important is that to our faith, to people's faith? How many lives have been changed because Luke said, I got to include that parable. I got to include that parable of Jesus. So by Luke's gospel, people's lives are changed. But Luke had to do his homework. Is it God's word? Yes. Was Luke a fully human author? Yes. So is it God's word or is it Luke's word? The answer is both and. It's the word of God written in human words. You see, when we read the Bible, we don't check our brains at the door. No, God gave us this brain. God gave us sciences to help inform our brain. 
And if we really want to understand what Genesis is telling us, or the book of Deuteronomy, or the book of Job, what we have to do is we have to go back in time and say, how did they write? How did they tell their most important truths? How did they communicate the things that were most crucial to them? What forms of speech did they use? How did language work thousands of years ago, before Christ? Because the way we speak and write and expect communication to happen is not how it worked back then. We do not check our brains at the door. God instead gave us intellect. So we must use our intellect to understand the Bible today. There is not a necessary division between science and faith, between science and revelation. In fact, one of the great saints of the church has said, anything that tells us the truth is leading us to God because God is the author of all truth. So if science teaches us something that's true, really true, then it's helping us understand God and the universe that God has made. And as Christians, we need to remember that the Bible is teaching us salvation, history. It's teaching us the saving truth. That's how it's the living word of God. So glad that you joined with us this week. I look forward to seeing you next week. And if you have any questions, contact our church and we would love to answer them to the best of our abilities. Take care and have a blessed week. Amen. Mm -hmm.